And one of those values is that we, we never give up. You know, what we are working on is so important that it uh, requires determination and conviction. And even sometimes we need to make the impossible possible. So that was a bit the spirit of, of uh, climbing the Kilimanjaro. It's been a bit of a dream for a couple of years. So literally 48 hours ago, this picture was, uh, was taken on top of the, uh, the mountain. And of course, SPP should be uh, with me, carrying it all the way up uh, to the top. But what we are thinking about is, you know, everybody has their own personal challenges. You all have things you want to do, bucket list, etc. So we are, we are sort of trying to put a, a challenge out there to our community that if you have uh, something that is, you know, interesting, let us know. We'll send you the flag in, in one way or the other and make sure that the SPP flag is scattered around the world, whether it's a cleanup or whether it is a mountain or whether it is a marathon or you know whatever it is that has been inspiring you to do uh, something above and beyond this is what i think is is one of the attributes of, of spp so we thought I'll, I'll start with this and we'll invite uh, all of you to to share your your little challenges and, and you'll hear much more about that so so that's it um, amazing uh, agenda has been prepared oliver is going to go through that we have some uh, very nice uh, updates um, that we can share with you. So I will tune out and let Oliver take you through a lot of the content. Thanks, Thomas. So yeah, as I said, this is something we we sort of talked about literally a few in the last. So, sorry to inter interrupt. But I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to know whether we'll be sharing this PPT or PowerPoint presentation to us. We will, Manish. Yes, we will. We okay. will share the slides and the recording with you. Don't worry. Thank you, Manish. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, something we agreed in the last hour or so. If you do want to, um, you know, proudly share your commitment to sustainable procurement and uh, and have a flag, then do put a post in the chat. If you've got something coming up where you feel you can post a picture of it, and uh, then we'll see if we can sort out a flag for you. Uh, but please do that. It's spreading the word of this is uh, is pretty pretty critical. So we have a packed agenda, and I'm going to ask my fellow SPP team to try and rattle through our parts of the agenda because whilst we've got some exciting updates we've got an even more exciting uh, couple of speakers to be joining us to get us into the real topic and the real tools uh, of, uh, of the challenge of sustainable procurement and in particular we'll be covering transparency and traceability uh, today to delighted to be joined by both Lynn and Ashish who you will meet very soon. So there are many well, first timers coming to the meeting so First of all, my name is Oliver Hurry. Uh, I'm part of the SPP team uh, together with the co-founders, Thomas Uderson of obviously the CPO of Bayer and, and Bertrand, the CPO of Hinkle, who created this, uh, this, this inspirational movement maybe three, three year or so years ago now, I think it was. But just to give you a guide of who we are and what we are, we are procurement. This is about procurement taking charge of its future as a profession, but also to protect people and planet. Uh, there are many, many different networks and um, platforms out there on sustainability and indeed for procurement. And this is for procurement by procurement, and it's about really focusing on translating sustainability and making it easier for you as procurement professionals to just get on and do it. Obviously, we have a vision uh, that is for all supply chains to have embedded sustainable procurement. You know, it's the same old story, really. We want there to be not such a thing as sustainable procurement just normal good procurement. The same with responsible sourcing. We just want responsible sourcing to be normal. Obviously, bold vision, but that's that's what we want. So our goal really is to get a huge movement and a vast change in procurement as a profession. We believe that there's about a million procurement professionals that if we can reach and engage both up and down supply chains in small companies in large companies, um, we can drive an extraordinary amount of change. We also want to track that we're having an impact, though. Uh, we're working with Gartner now uh, to measure our impact as an organization, and we're already tracking over three quarters of you are telling, telling us that we have positively impacted your decision making in the last three years uh, or even in the last year. We want to keep that up. Uh, more goals and more uh, metrics will be added as uh, the organization grows. One key thing I want to highlight is we need to get to, in our hockey stick plan, 10,000 ambassadors by the end of this year. Uh, we're currently just about to get to 8,500, so we're on track for this year, uh, but we do need you to spread the word and tell your colleagues. Our strategy is based on two things that people tell us stop them embedding sustainability in procurement. One is not knowing the tools and, and the knowledge or not having the knowledge. The other is my boss won't let me. To put it bluntly. So the two key parts of our strategy are to empower and equip you as procurement professionals with 
anything we can find, all the tools and knowledge that we can find, and particularly putting it into one place and translating it for you. And the second part is encouraging and enabling and empowering leadership um, to support. So just wanted to give this a, a highlight. As I said, we are tracking impact. Um, it is quite remarkable results given that we are as have been a zero budget, completely volunteer led initiative for the last three years. That is changing quite nicely. Uh, but as I said, we are already having a wonderful impact. And that is down to many of you persevering, being very patient, despite our inability sometimes to do everything that we, we could do and want to do. Uh, but huge thanks to all of you that have been supporting us on this journey. We seem to be doing a relatively decent job. Uh, and with our announcements we're about to make, hopefully we can make it even better. So the final kind of piece I want to talk about in terms of what do we actually do? So SPP is about closing the gaps and getting rid of the excuses as to why we can't just embed sustainability in procurement. It's about not knowing what to do. It's about not knowing how to do it. It's about not knowing who to do it with. And it's not knowing how to engage and support leadership to enable you to do it. So those are the four areas that we try to help through with content, meetings, tools, and really all of the activity we do is centered around either empowering, equipping you or encouraging leadership to enable and support you. Hopefully that explains that. So I'd like to hand over to what we call our advocacy team now. So the team at SPP, hopefully Astrid, you're there um, to talk us through what people on this call, if they haven't already, can do to take part in the SPP. Hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, I hurry up because uh, not only, only Oliver Harry said that we have a full agenda, but um, we have also a mission, right? You heard it before, 10,000 should be uh, in our community until the end of the year, and we want to grow to 1 million until 2030, which is quite a mission. Uh, and this is, uh, I saw in the chat, uh, you are, there are few newcomers, or a lot of newcomers, actually, who are maybe not... Um, part of the community yet and therefore the first thing that you could do after this call or during the, this call even is to join the pledge and it's very easy if you go to LinkedIn you would find us uh, automatically there is one central place uh, the company page where you find a link to a community which is called the sustainable procurement ambassadors and if you join the community you won't miss anything that is exchanged in the community community this is the first good news uh, and secondly you will be counted to the 10000 this year and uh, 1 million until 2030 if you want to go beyond uh, not only being an ambassador but maybe join a chapter and lead one of the chapters that we have already then this would be the opportunity to join or open one of the not existing chapters that can be either an industry chapter, a regional chapter, or a chapter that uh, focus on the specific topics, for example, human rights or supplier diversity is something that we have already. And you see some of the guys who are already engaged in those uh, chapters. The third thing, and uh, I think this is also something that you will mention later, Oli, is uh, you can become an SPP champion, which is even uh, another league and another area where you can join and commit to the Sustainable Procurement Pledge. Uh, this is the third option. And uh, if you want to support um, SPP also with a donation, you see some of the guys uh, who did it already, Kovacs and give with. This is the fourth opportunity to support SPP. So lots of opportunities. Don't miss the chance. Please join us. Uh, we need to grow and to have a critical mass to make the impact that we are aiming for. Yeah, I think this is uh, now, if you want to flip through, I think this is what we covered already. You said uh, what's in it for you, the community, of course, case studies, best practices, all that builds up uh, capabilities and knowledge you will find in the community on sbp.earth. This is our homepage where all the um, experience that we gather from our community is shared. And what you would also find there is the technology list, um, an overview of technology providers that are engaged in the sustainable procurement um, sector. So such as uh, transparency tools and also traceability tools, which leads perfectly to our focus topic today. Good, from ple um, pledge to action, you see uh, what you can do and you find many of uh, co-ambassadors on LinkedIn already, you can add the SPP button to your profile picture on LinkedIn to make you visible to the, your network and also to the community that you belong to SPP. The second thing that you may want to consider is that you as, uh, add SPP to your um, CV, to the line of um, 
of your experience in, on LinkedIn. So this would help that anytime when we update uh, something in SVP, you would be notified as an employee, so to say, with SVP. So you wouldn't miss any of the updates that are essential for the community. And then thirdly, and this is really essential again for the growth, is that you invite your personal network also to join SVP so that we um, become a bigger community and tribe. You are muted, Oli. Aren't I? I am. Uh, thank you, Astrid. Uh, really great. As I said, it's it is a non-profit community. We are trying to have a real impact. So scale is absolutely crucial to us, but also is getting things done. So um, thanks, Astrid. As I said, please do invite your uh, peers and your colleagues um, to join us in a variety of different ways. So, Patron, uh, are you there? Would you like to give um, the next exciting update about where we're getting to as an organisation? I am there, Oliver. Hey, welcome. Nice to see you all and nice to be with all of you. Um, so where are we going to? Um, as, uh, as we shared with you, the organization is not only growing, but also your inspiration to move further to the, the new peaks that we, we have decided to reach in 2022 and beyond uh, have also allowed us, uh, thanks in particular to also all the champions behind and supporters now to go to the next level of investing in, in a team on top of uh, the team existing. So we will have now a new uh, executive director joining us um, as of the 1st of November. What do we mean by this? We will still be that organization from uh, bottom up and growing with many people like us, engaging voluntary and pro bono into the organization. But if you want to reach the level that we have define it in our vision, in our mission, in our targets until 2030. We also need to, to bring together and to build up an organization which will be available, I allow me to say 24 seven, if I may say so, in other words, fully dedicated to the organization. So the team has been through uh, looking for uh, a person that we will have to have with us as first employee, if we may say from that organization and taking the lead of executive director of, of SPP. And um, this person will be uh, available uh, on the job on 1st of November. We'll start to engage with the team first, uh, um, currently step by step into the organization, but really officially in the job on the 1st of November. And from there, we will uh, move further. So we will start. And, um, and we have been probably very much inspired by another organization into which we are, many of us are active, which is a Together for Sustainability organization, where we are more than... Uh, 200 very active members into, into this organization, but six, seven people are really at, also at the core and belong to the TFS organization in order to manage that entire network and entire organization that we have. And the same will happen in SPP. So this is why we, we are very pleased to, to announce to all of you that uh, Melissa, uh, Melissa de Roquebrune uh, from Canada, but not living in Canada currently, living in, in, in Germany, but having been through a very international journey that she will introduce to the organization in due time and to all of you, um, we'll join uh, the SPP organization and will with this into this role with all of us, give also not only the time dedication, but also a lot of uh, energy and a lot of also experience that she got into the nonprofit also uh, environment and the ability not only to find funders, but also in donators, but very, very much to scale up uh, that organization and together to achieve. So this is very, very important um, to SPP. And this is the moment to share that with all of you. Uh, Melissa will join us. We will not do it today, but we will, she will join us in one of our next call to already start to introduce herself to all of us into the community, into the SPP organization. But we want to share that with you all today to tell you that we are ready now to go to the next level. And this is uh, what we like to address to you with this message today. With this, um, Oliver, you have been very in instrumental with Thomas uh, to make that step and also many other people into the organization. Thomas is not with us as you may be shared already because he has just uh, kissed the, the peak of the Kilimanjaro. So that's why he's not with us today, but uh, he is, uh, we are with him. And uh, uh, Oliver, thank you very much for everything that you and your colleagues have done to come to that point. 
Back yeah. to you. I made it down from the top, Bertrand. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> he is here, I promise. He is here. No, thank you, Bertrand. And, and as I said, it was an extraordinary number of people who applied. Uh, what an extraordinary opportunity this role is. Um, if we were a business, we would be a unicorn startup, uh, clearly. Um, it is an incredible opportunity. And Melissa is wonderful. She is a fantastic opportunity for us brings wonderful skills to it and we're so excited to be working with her and looking forward to for her to meet you guys as well because you are frankly the heartbeat of it all so yeah very very excited and congratulations to the team so to another part of the team uh, the capability building team which is really the knowledge the content the tools that you need so um over to Halid if you're there can you uh, talk us through your quick update Sure. Thanks, Holly. Um, hi, hi, everyone. This is Holly from the capacity building team. Definitely not as exciting as the, the last message on uh, the executive director, but we, we do have some interesting pieces of content uh, coming out to our ambassadors in the spirit of uh, empowering and enabling. So uh, there's already three posts that are, are up on svp.earth and I'll, I'll I'll post them in the chat uh, in a second. Uh, and they're all about tra traceability and transparency and blockchain and they'll help support the, the content of this meeting here today. But more exciting than that, uh, you might have heard that we're working on a project called the Sustainable Procurement Wheel. It's a partnership with uh, another organization called the Embedding Project. And what we're doing there is we're developing, similar to the typical procurement wheel uh, that we, we've seen uh, in the supply chain uh, content for quite a while. We're, we're build, building one with sustainability embedded into that, embedded into all the steps from specifications to RFP and through supply performance management and so forth. And as soon as we're ready, you'll definitely hear from us because we want our ambassadors uh, to be part of this process. We want to make sure that, that, that we, we leverage this amazing community that we have with all the that diversity of, of thought and experiences. So you'll be hearing from us through our, our advocacy team about how to join this project uh, once we're ready. And then quick uh, update on the, the next meeting. Uh, as you've heard uh, just briefly ago, uh, we have a number of champions that we've onboarded and uh, within these champions, we're getting a very uh, powerful cohort of, of procurement professionals and, 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 and CPOs that, that are working to transform procurement and we're, we're building a few panels. And one of these panels is called the transformation panel. We'll be working for about a year on the challenges of change management uh, within sustainable procurement and how do you drive that through the organization. So you'll be able to meet uh, that, that panel and uh, discuss a little bit about that topic on, on the next uh, ambassador meeting. And uh, hopefully in about a year time, we'll have some good content uh, coming out on, on that topic. And uh, last but definitely you know, not least, uh, we have a new team member, uh, Sarah Mullins. So Sarah, if you're there, if, and if you want to say hi to everyone. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, it's obviously a huge community, and it's a very exciting time to be joining the SPP. So I'm looking forward to more meetings with you and getting to work more with you. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Back to you, Ollie. Excellent. Thank you, team. Thank you, team. More on the transformation panel uh, very shortly. But yes, the next meeting is on the 8th of December. You'll all get the invite, um, but we will be tackling change management. And we have literally uh, the best possible change management panel I think we can build in procurement that will be leading and supporting us with that uh, and moving forward. So that's really what we're about is change management. So it's probably one of the most important meetings I think we have uh, ever had. So please make sure that you uh, keep track of that and stick it in your diary uh, soon. So almost at the end, really, of the of the update, but we wanted to highlight exactly how we are driving change with you um, as as become professionals. And this has been talked about recently, but really is now becoming quite concrete. So we believe in order to drive change, there are really three core groups of people that we need to help um, in the procurement function. We've obviously got to enable and support champions at the, at the procurement leadership level to drive that change. We have an extraordinary league of champions that will be meeting quarterly uh, now to really understand what good sustainable procurement leadership looks like and actually help to build a guide of sustainable procurement leadership from all of their experiences, the things that have worked, the things that haven't worked for the rest of any procurement leaders uh, around the world at any level. So that's very excited to be to be doing that. More on that in a second. The second group is really those that are tasked with transformation 
and building the capability in procurement and really trying to embed sustainability. That is a tough job. Uh, and so they are forming our transformational panel. Uh, they will meet also quarterly. They will also coordinate with the CPO panel to help educate and support them as well. Um, so we're really excited about that panel, um, which is going to be chaired by Lewis Howard uh, of GSK as well. So thank you to Lewis. But more on that um, also in a second. But there is something for everyone. As I said, absolutely anyone in procurement can join any of our chapters and join their meetings to get a kind of filtered experience, almost a choose your own adventure as a procurement professional. You can choose which region, which industry, and which issues are the most important ones to you. And that will enable us to help provide meetings, tailored meetings, more specific meetings for all of you. So um, onto our League of Champions. In order to grow the organization and be able to build out the organization and hire our first employees, um, we are absolutely indebted to this range of companies that have been helping us to do that. Not only are they obviously helping to donate to the organization, but they're bringing their procurement functions at some point soon, ultimately into the uh, SPP. This will help us accelerate our growth and, and accelerate the capability building we can do for all of their procurement functions. So it's amazing leadership um, from this range of champions. This is the range of champions you can see that were announced at the last meeting and so indebted to these pioneers that have helped us um, to get off the mark. Today, absolutely delighted to announce the next five. There are quite a few more uh, that are about to be announced. Many we had to get through a few hurdles, obviously, with uh, communications and everything else. But and we will be announcing many more before the end of the year. But delighted to have Klockner Pentapast, uh, Bayer, obviously, Colgate, Palmolive, CBRE, which is obviously helping to bring their expertise from the property and real estate world, and Thermo Fisher as well. So a real variety as well, joining um, uh, the SPP and helping to support and enable um, their procurement functions. So fantastic leadership from, from those companies. We cannot thank you uh, enough. So who are the League of Champions? Uh, this is our current League of Champions, the first 15 procurement leaders that have signed up to our uh, our, our league. This is the league that will be meeting for the first time on the 30th of September, or most of them will, uh, and then and many again will be meeting on the 8th of December and so on, and they will be working together to really help us understand how we can help other procurement leaders and indeed help themselves to drive this change in sustainability. It's a wonderful array of people. I'm going to call it out that there isn't enough diversity uh, in this group, frankly. Uh, we do want more diversity in this group. We Anyone who's in any part of the world um, that wants to join this league, please do get in touch. We want the power is in the diversity. Um, so we do feel like that's a, an area we need to build upon. Um, but as I said, a wonderful group uh, of ladies and gentlemen that will be uh, an extraordinary league of ladies and gentlemen, if you like, that will helping, uh, help us get there. And huge thanks to the, uh, the former CPO of Maersk, in fact, Henrik, who's helping to chair that as well. So finally, for all of you, do find your tribe, filter your SPP. So go to spp.earth, find your chapter, whether you're, it's a region or an issue or an industry, and do join your chapter uh, and do join their specific meetings. There's almost a meeting every week now that you can join, which you wouldn't want to, uh, but I can assure you there's plenty on offer. Right. Thank you, everyone. Um, huge thanks for listening to that. Huge thanks for the update. Um, as I said, hopefully you can pass that information on. Hopefully you're a little bit more aware for those of you that are joining for the first time about what on earth SPP is. But SPP really is about knowledge and tools and content. So delighted to be joined by Lynn and Ashish today to tackle the topic that you all voted for actually some time ago at our last meetings uh, to tackle next, which is tra transparency and traceability in supply chains. A huge topic that we definitely won't obviously tackle all of it in the next sort of 40 minutes or so. Uh, but hopefully we can hear some real practical advice um, from Lynn and Ashish who are delighted to join us. But it's also about you. Just to explain, it's very important that we will record this session, obviously for other procurement professionals, but it isn't just about what Lynn and Ashish can share. We want to know what you've got to share. So please put in the chat now any links, examples, thoughts, ideas that you feel are really important, um, that you feel like you can share. All of that content will be digested into a report, a very simple summary report, links and ideas that we will share with you after this event. So if there is anything you feel you should be sharing, um, then please do add that to the chat. 
We also want your questions. However, if you've got a question for the panel, and we will do plenty of Q&A, I'd like you to in, uh, encourage you guys to raise your hands. So if you go to the uh, bar and look at the responses uh, 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 button, you'll be able to raise your hand. You can clap, you can raise, you can do a crying emoji. I don't mind, whatever it is you like. But if you do put something on there, I will come to you uh, and ask you to add your thoughts um, as we get towards the, the second half of the discussion. So you can put questions in the chat as well. Obviously, we'll try and pick those up. But as I said, we really do want to hear your voice as much as we want to, um, to read out your question. So Lynn, Ashish, if you're there, hello. Um, delighted to have you with us. Um, as I said, I know you guys have been both working together on this uh, topic. So delighted to have you both and have both of your um, perspectives. And, and Lynn, also special thanks to you for being one of our SPP champions as well. I think it's absolutely delighted to have you, but also Solvay um, involved. So um, I, I'm gonna come off the, take the slide off now so we can actually see your faces uh, and, uh, and, and I'll just pin you to the, uh, uh, to the thing so everyone can see you. Uh, right, let's just find you, Ashish, so we can see you. Beard or not, we've still got to be able to see you. Uh, there we go. There we go. What a pair. Excellent. So um, on this topic, it is a huge topic. So perhaps I can start with you, Lynn. Um, you know, what does transparency and traceability mean to you? And what are some of the key challenges in achieving this? It's a, it's a huge task, isn't it? But perhaps you can frame it and frame the challenge for us first. Okay, uh, thank you, Oliver, and very nice to be with the whole SPP community. Good to see the big smile of Ashis. Huh? He, when he smiles, everybody starts smiling. So, uh, And I actually did not know the topic was voted as a number one topic because it's really, really complex, right? And and I guess why why it's complex is because there's so many different expectations on what it actually means, right, across companies and across different procurement organizations. So I guess let me try to to explain on what it meant to me personally to solve it, and how Bank U and in partnership with a bigger ecosystem actually allowed us to to close the gap between intentions and and delivery. Right. So. When you think about a global supply chain, right? I think most most of us uh, think about images of huge containers, big trucks, you know, high, I mean, arriving at those big distribution centers. Um, the global supply chains really start before that point, right? And 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 our actions to make, you know, the first step visible, traceable, uh, equitable, and I think that's the word we missed, by the way, in the. In, in the description, it, it really started at the beginning. So all of us working in sustainability, we know there's very long paths uh, that that supply chain follows from the farmers, from the miners, from, you know, a person. And I wanted to see that person, know them, right? So, and I wanted our buyers and our customers to see that their everyday products, you know, you know, behind the purchase price and the margin, that there's real people and real challenges and unpredictable weather and really difficult roads to market, right? So the key to transparency was really to make those individuals, in the case of Solve farmers, and we will talk about that, visible. And for them, for those people also to understand that they that they are important to us in the supply chain, that they're that they matter, right? So visibility really from that first um, step. And we had a very concrete use case in Solve, our guar supply chain. And for the people that don't know I mean, what is guar, it's 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 a plant uh, growing the majority growing um, in India and in, in Rajasthan. And we use it, the seeds, we use it for um, personal care products like um, shampoos and, and conditioners. And Solve is the largest customer to many FMCG companies, right? So we launched back in, in, in 2015 an initiative which we call the Sustainable Guar Initiative and worked, you know, today to more than, you know, 7,000 farmers of which, you know, 25% are women. And, and we really had important results, right? We doubled guar yields, we, we doubled revenues to the farmers, but, and here's the but, right? Now I dump all the challenges that I had at the time. First of all, when I arrived, we only had aggregate data, right? So the farmers were not visible. And it was important to increase the trust in the system, you know, tracing the transaction from really the guar fields to the, to the shampoo. Also, um, you know, understanding the payment dynamics 
right? So, so are we, what are we paying? What's the price? Um, are we mates getting back to those farmers, to the female, empower female farmers, but in the first place, you know, prove they're female, you know, I mean, right beyond consent. So the trust was important and a sophisticated understanding of this whole payment dynamic um, across, across the supply chain. Second a problem I had was I wanted to have all the supply chain actors from the farmers to the cooperatives, through the NGOs that we were working with locally up to the customers to participate a little bit in more equal terms, right? Like virtual handshake that we could take stock of, of everything that was going, happening, uh, going to happen along that supply chain. And then third, and I, I told her, she's, I wanna just go faster than the conventional wisdom. I mean, everybody tells me it takes two years to get this up and running, right? So I just wanna go fast. So um, I reviewed with the team different solutions, you know, one more complex than the other, huge infrastructure, IT infrastructure changes. I mean, couldn't even grasp all the complexity uh, around that. And, and again, every time I, I didn't feel that, you know, the miner or in this case, the guar farmer was taking, taking into, into, in, into account, right? So um, we started working with Banku and then I, you know, I, I leave it uh, to Ashish to explain, but we started working over a year ago. And since Q4 last year, beginning of Q4 last year, we, we really have solved Guar transactions uh, recorded on a digital platform, leveraging blockchain technology. And today we have more than 2000 farmers with a face, with a name, with a zip code, with a, with a piece of land of which I know how big that land is of which 20% female, and now, and now, you know, I, I know it's not 25%, but 20%, how much volume they sell, how much, you know, what's the price we pay if their children go to school and more, right? So um, I think it's um, it's an incredible journey with, with a lot of issues um, as well, but what is important is that we made the Guar supply chain and, and soon many more use, use, use cases in other value chain, transparent and, equitable right so people in addition to planet right and profits i want to pause here for a second and give it maybe to ashis <laughs> yeah that's great yeah it's great and um it, it's about uh moving beyond faceless numbers isn't it it's about um, enabling procurement to get understand that holy grail of what is actually happening on the ground whilst doing a million things but actually being able to easily understand the story and the reality isn't that and actually that, that, that desire to know what's happening on the ground and the realities on the ground is i suppose what's driven you to to do what you do so tell us more absolutely no first of all thank you thank you uh, to you and, and thomas and lynn and everybody i just appreciate um, the opportunity to be here uh, I'm at an airport, so apologies for any background noise. But I think what I want to quickly start with is the problem, right? And I'm a big believer, if you never see me again, please remember that the problem exists at the mama farmer's level and the problem exists at the mama waste picker level, right? None of us are relevant at the end of the day if we cannot be the voice for the mama farmer or the voice for the mama waste picker, okay? Um, and you can hear me clearly, right? Is that good? Okay. Perfect. Um, so I think just to make sure, right, and it won't take too long, but I, I think it's important to go back to where I started the journey. So in 2014, I was volunteering in the DRC in Congo, um, in Bukavu, and I was uh, a volunteer for USAID, and I'd spent a couple of years working with smallholder farmers. And at the end of 2014, one of the mama farmers, and women are smarter than men, if you disagree, jump off this call. Um, and it's just a fact, right? And one of this mama farmer uh, came to me and said she wanted to open a bank account. And we were buying her crops, right? Coffee and maize and everything. And it was in a supply chain. Her children, unfortunately, were working as child laborers um, in the mine down street for cobalt, you know, powering your smartphones and things like that. Um, so I went with her to the local bank and the local bank refused to let her open a bank account. And I think it's really important to understand this problem which exists in today's supply chains and procurement from the procurement perspective. Because even though we were buying her coffee and you were paying, you know, $14 for a coffee that was, you know, quote unquote, traceable or fair trade or whatever way you want to look at it. The reality, right? The reality for that mother was very different because even though her coffee was upstream selling uh, at a high premium, she was refused a bank account. And the local bank said no, because she was a woman farmer. 
she could not prove her existence in that supply chain beyond a measure of doubt. And most importantly, she could not be verified. And that is when the guy says to me, I can't bank her, but I'll bank you looking at me, right? So that's where the name comes from in case you're wondering what bank you stands for. And it really, really bothered me because this was 2014, you know, internet, WhatsApp, and based on this mother had an SMS phone. This mother was using mobile money, no smartphone, SMS, right? And the problem that I uncovered that day was very simple to, to explain, which is there are millions of mama farmers and there are millions of mama waste pickers who work in our global supply chains every day, performing the most hard work of actually procuring the raw material. Because fast forward four weeks ago, I was at a landfill called Chunga in Lusaka, Zambia. Go get on a plane and see it. It's one of the largest landfills you'll find. And I met Ida, a mama waste picker, who works an 18-hour shift in a very dangerous landfill, picking up the plastic that you might have in your hand that says recycle PET, and you're feeling good about the environment because you think you're saving the planet because that plastic is 100% recycled PET. But the reality is no different from the mama farmer back in 2014. And the reality for the mama waste picker is that she is unbanked and she cannot prove her existence in the supply chain. So the problem is that the procurement of that plastic, which becomes resin, which becomes a recycled bottle, is no different from the procurement of the coffee that shows up in your coffee cup. And in both these cases, the supply chain has a blind spot, as Lynn explained. And the blind spot is that the last mile, which is the mama farmer, or the first mile, which is the mama waste picker, does not have the ability to prove her existence in that supply chain, right? So if you never see me again, remember that that is the problem we're all trying to solve because it's not equitable if the mother cannot say, I grow your coffee. So fast forward, we started using blockchain without cryptocurrency. So if you're expecting any crypto tips not happening today, and it's green because we do not touch the token side, the value for the mama, do not oh, forget this, the value for the mama is that through her SMS phone. Now she gets an SMS message saying, Mama, you are a supplier to Solve, and you have sold 40 kilos of guar at 16% moisture in the local language. And that mama farmer is literate. Literacy is relative, guys. And she gets the message in Hindi or Gujarati or whatever the language is. Because remember, the supply chain, as Lynn explained, is Mama to the cooperative cooperative to the aggregator, aggregator to the processor, and on to a fashion brand, right? To solve The definition of traceability and transparency is that when the mother sells her guar, if it is equitable, then she gets an SMS confirmation through blockchain that confirms her existence. Lynn sitting in France can see that the guar changed hands, chain of custody, no mass balance, right? All the supply chain wonks on the call, no mass balance, because when the cooperative fills the batch that's going to move upstream through blockchain, that lot identifies mama one, mama two, could be dad one, dad two. So that now, as the supply chain is progressing, as the chain of custody is progressing, through simple software as a service blockchain, every person in that supply chain knows who was the farmer, where was it aggregated, who were in that aggregated lot, and as it's moving upstream, Lynn can log on to her phone and say, we purchased 400 kilograms, 330 coming from John and 70 coming from Susan. Well, different names in India, obviously, right? And that is how we have looked at the value of a blockchain-based supply chain it's still a supply chain software. The difference is that now it's equitable, traceable and transparent because fast forward, the value is there for Solvay. Don't get me wrong, right? And Lynn, you've known me for a long time. But the real value is the mother now is building an economic passport as a supplier that nobody can ever deny. While the brand is starting to build this traceable transparent system that also is equitable. Let me stop there.
Yeah, no, that's great. And, and, and guys, some great comments and thoughts and questions. And please do keep keep adding thoughts and questions. And as I said, we want your thoughts and ideas and opinions as well as questions. This isn't, you know, this is about all of that. And um, there was it's a fascinating story, and, and I think it brings a reality of what's happening on the ground and the fact that you know we need to enable suppliers and capability build suppliers to keep providing that um, that product safely and securely and correctly and, and everything else. And there was one thing that I think it, I wanted to pick up you mentioned was about that challenge of waste pickers and the social impact there. And I think uh, we've often seen procurement professionals have to deal with the complexity of sustainability and carbon and waste and circular economy. And often that sort of double whammy of saying, well, I'm afraid that recycled this isn't necessarily perfect. There are these social impact challenges. How does procurement cope with that, that complexity and that double whammy of having to deal with multiple factors? And Leon, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, and perhaps Ashish, you can come second. How does procurement manage those trade-offs when they think they're doing something right and realise that there's more to it? Yeah, quickly from, from my side. Uh, so um, let's acknowledge that by having those processes, right, or the, this transparency, we actually discover a lot of gaps in the supply chain, right? So one of them, I mean, exactly right. And by the way, actually, we know each other from the beverage industry, right? So, and I was personally in Mexico, so, so where we were shocked, right, finding actually the last mile, right? Now we're not talking about the first mile, but the last mile that, you know, involved indeed a community picking that glass extremely dangerous right which was something that we couldn't I mean, we were very proud we're we're kind of launching recycling glass there but you know suddenly we had a huge understanding right so it's actually thanks to the commitment of i want to deeply know my supply chain that you discover probably aspects of it that you don't like and that you need to act um upon right so and i think you know circularity Another example I would give is we're, you know, we're very focused on batteries, right? And on an electric ecosystem, but, you know, battery recycling goes into aspects of a supply chain, again, that deeply touches those individuals that are involved in, in, in that. So I think by having a commitment, I want to deeply know my supply chain, please find the partners that help you do that, that you can actually really make a difference and, and you know, at, at, at a faster pace than, you know, you would wait and follow the regulatory frameworks that in the end will oblige you to do this anyway. And she's back to you. So that's a perfect, thank you for that. I would, I would add like some of the biggest challenges that we have faced um, and, and you know, the teams that we work with face is, is a simple word, it's courage, right? Courage is, I mean, you know, I think Lynn, Lynn has courage and she has been able to, and her team have been able to actually piss off people to get to the last mile, right? And I think my number one challenge that I see and I recommend you're going to see is that if you're not willing to break the status quo of saying, I really want to know, and I am willing to recognize the fraud or the challenges in my supply chain. If you take a look at bad rates, right? If you go to a landfill in India or Nigeria, there are children who are breaking apart old cell phones to take out the batteries, right? And you can turn a blind eye and go through a procurement supply chain, which will not give you visibility in that tier three and tier four, right? So the real challenge is execution more than the technology, because I think somebody asked a quick question and I want to address that, right? Like, how does blockchain become accessible? And I think the challenge is most people think about technologies like blockchain is like, oh my God, we're going to bring all the sophisticated technology to poor people. And somebody will think poor people are not literate, right? And I really take offense to that because poor people who are working in the landfills or smallholder farmers are extremely literate and they use SMS phones. They use mobile money, right? So we're not trying to slab more technology on people in poverty. What is missing is the recognition that past your tier one and tier two, your tier three and tier four has a lot of blind spots where people have been gaming the system. And you as procurement professionals or brands have to have the courage to say, I am willing to take on this fight because I want to get to my farmer in the Uyghur region who is growing cotton and is being held in slave labor. Does that help? Yeah, I think it. I think it does. And and Francisco, are you there? I, perhaps you could. Um, I know you asked that question, and perhaps just expand and, and on your question and 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 respond to that. It'd be good to get your thoughts as well if you're there. 
And you don't mind talking, of course. <laughs> you know, you're talking about me. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So around the, the technology, so what I had said is, so obviously I work at ZX and we are have a, the core of what we do is technology and I've, I've not worked on blockchain, but I've worked as a, in, as a front end developer before and I launched, uh, I developed a worker voice tool. Some of you might know as, as a prize or price audit. So it's a bit like, it's, um, anyway, it's, it's to complement the inspection of working conditions and the use of audits and to support auditors in inspecting working conditions on site. Um, and so obviously CEDEX is, a, is very centered around technology, but part of the work I've done and I still do is around making sure that we check the, the pros and cons of technology, that when we uh, deploy and roll out technology, that we, first of all, the way we develop technology and technological solutions, for example, something that workers will use to report on issues, then and feed into our procurement strategies, engagement suppliers, is something that is not just accessible, but is private, that respects the workers' rights, but also it's built on the capabilities of those communities, because you can develop the shiniest blockchain AI tool, uh, with all the best intentions but there's two things one you may build something that people won't use because it's not built within their uh, capabilities or their ecologies of communication and the second thing you can do more harm than good with what you're doing uh, and if your aim is just to tick uh, to tick a box then lots of tech is available for that if your change is really to have an impact then that's you that requires more work so i guess my question for this really brilliant panel is how can we be critical and careful when developing, implementing, rolling out this sort of technological processes to make sure we're not marginalizing workers, excluding suppliers, particularly those to whom maybe we, they are not a strategic supplier to us, but we are a strategic client for them. Maybe we are 90% of a family run uh, farm in Madagascar income revenue. And if we lose them as, if they lose us as a customer, they will have to shut down, shut, shut down doors of a generations old business, right? So how do we make sure that we're inclusive, that we respect and we are appropriate to the different suppliers within the, that we work with, the different types of businesses, locations, uh, and the different communities? Lovely. Guys, respond. Lynn, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll respond after Lynn. I think it's a brilliant question because that was exactly why, because of the points you mentioned, right? If it's all about the technology, why it wouldn't work? I couldn't make it work because first of all, I me mean, getting my head around all the technology that were presented, I, I wanted to start from a use case. I, I couldn't care less what technology, right? But like bring me visibility, that visibility matters. And, and I spoke to, and we spoke to many companies and yes, I was intimidated by the amount of complexity until I worked with her, she said, well, yeah, so I can make it happen, right? Let, let's, let's brainstorm around the use case. Oh, and what they need is a phone, right? The, the, the farmer needed a phone, right? Because they need to receive an SMS, right? And, and logically with the local implementation partners, we, we, we studied like, are there phones available? But, and, you know, they could show that, like, you know, 99% of, of the people, our farmers had, had a phone, right? It, it's not even, I think, a smartphone is an SMS. And then, you know, as a customer, you know, I log in, you know, on a platform and I follow the transactions, right? So the, the technology enabled the objective. And I think that was very important um, because it needs to be equitable and it, it needs to be inclusive and you cannot leave anybody out. Right, Ashis, uh, maybe you want to complete that. No, you, you're spot on, right? And, and look, I mean, I, I'm, I'm Indian, so I make fun, fun of Indians, right? I'd say if, the, if, if I meet another Indian who has an app for poor people, I'm going to lose it, right? I'm going to lose whatever hair is left on my head. Because that's the, that's, I mean, you asked a very good question, Francesca. So we, the, our approach has been not technology for the sake of tef, not technology, right? You have to meet people where they're. And, and I think concrete examples that are real world are important. I'll give you one very concrete example of the Zambia Congo border. And then you've, you've known this because of the beverage days. In 2018, we started a rollout for the cassava farmers for a beer company, right? And if you are standing on the Zambia Congo border in a region called Mansa, it's one of the most dangerous, hard places in the world, women farmers do use SMS phone there and they use mobile money, which is M-Pesa, okay? In 2018, when we started that rollout for cassava, one of the women farmers told me that, hey, you know what, if, if the 
money, and this piece is key, which will answer your question with a live example. If the payment was in cash, then the rats will eat it. Rats meaning the husband, the son, the son-in-law, or somebody else, right? But if you did a direct deposit on the M-Pesa account, that will help. So fast forward, not blockchain for blockchain's sake, we just connected our supply chain platform to MTN, Airtel, and Vodacom. And the first transaction we did where the mother now gets paid from an accessibility perspective, right? So we're not teaching our blockchain. There is no new app. She comes, sells her cassava. She gets an SMS message. So somebody asked the question, the how, right? The how is critical. She now agrees, I've sold this cassava. This is the price point and I'm agreeing to it. She says, pay me. The money gets deposited on her SMS phone in M-Pesa. And you know what she did? She started laughing. I thought she was laughing at me. No, she was laughing because she had turned around and paid M-Pesa for her child's school fees on the Zambia Congo border. She didn't care it was blockchain. What she cared was now she has a mobile money account that allows her to get paid for the cassava she has cultivated. She can agree to the quality. She doesn't have to worry about the rats eating the cash and she pays for her child's education all through the power of an SMS phone, right? And that is the level of thinking you have to put in if you truly want to streamline your supply chains with equitability. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, it does. And I, I think, again, it, I've, I've seen so many demos of so many different technologies in procurement, and I think people get fixated with the technology itself, the story of what the bell and the whistle does and the features and the dashboards and everything else. And I think it's we need technology with an appreciation of the reality and an appreciation of um, you know, with some soul, if dare I say. It. And I think this is an example of where you know, blockchain almost itself has done itself a, a damage because it's made itself so confusing, concentrating what blockchain is rather than what it does. And I, that's why I personally love this story. So um, some more questions. Um, Emma Howcroft, if you're there, um, I think you asked, him, uh, we're having asked, asked a question to Lynn really about what sort of levels and what type of supply chain are we talking about here? So uh, Emma, if you're there, do you want to just expand on your question? Yes, I was, I was just, thanks, Oliver. I was just trying to understand how many levels you had or supply levels you had in between yourself and your farmers um, to understand, I, I suppose, how, how simple it was to reach the farmers or whether it was actually extremely complicated. I think it would just be helpful for all of us to understand that. Yes, thank you for the question. So from the farmer to us, and we're part of the supply chain, right? So there is there's there's probably two two steps right there's the cooperatives uh basically uh that are in the middle right where where, where we work with them to buy the guar at an aggregated level okay so it doesn't sound it doesn't sound complex right but it does because still we have nine nine thousand farmers on the forefront you know that were invisible so the most complex part was really again between farmers up to the cooperative now we ourselves were also part of the supply chain right so we deliver to fmcg companies some of them are, are on this call that actually demanded us hey you know prove your um you know the traceability of for example a payment or a rebate they would pay to us so Despite the fact that maybe there's much longer supply chains out there, um, and we're not touching, for example, a last mile, like we discussed beverage, where there's the recycling, right? It's really that first mile that is the most absolute complex one, and the implementation um, of an initiative like that and the commitment on the ground, I think, as she's mentioned, you know, you're going to step on some toes. You're going to definitely step on some toes uh, locally. Right, that is the most complex. So it's not the amount of steps I would uh, I would suggest, but it's really that first part. But short answer, there is uh, four steps in between. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, Matthew, um, a fairly simple question, but I'm going to ask you to ask it anyway. If you're there, just to say hello. Um, if you're there, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, fairly simple question. I was just interested to understand, Lynn, uh, how you prioritized the GUA supply chain, if I, if I understand correctly. Sorry for my ignorance there on the specific, um, the farming. 
But I think that that's a key key topic, at least for us. It's about also identifying for which of our materials, for what supply chain we should start with on, on traceability, sustain, um, traceability, visibility. So I'm interested to hear what factors you took into account to say it's so important that we see visibility here. Absolutely. I think it's a great question, right? So we started with the GUAR supply chain because we had the Sustainable GUAR initiative that was running since 2015 and we were very public about, very open about, right? So it was it's a very big initiative for solving. So hence, we need to be we needed to be 100% sure as well of all the you know commitments and statements that we made out there. So remember I said the trust in the system was very important. So whilst the setup um, uh, naturally draws to that to that you know supply chain or value chain because already of the sustainability commitments uh, around that, um, I think that didn't prevent us to have a whole long list of other you know value chains out there um, amongst others in the mining uh, industry. You know, um, but but the, the setup really and, and the exposure around that supply chain, I think, particular there's there was an emotional component, right? It was the Sustainable Guar Initiative centered around empowerment uh, of women. Um, and I think the, the equitable part, you know, we were, we were touching on so many aspects that were so important to us solve it, right? Around making the Guar farmers visible, empowering the women through that, like the bank you story, right? So, hey, I exist, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a supplier to, to solve it, I'm bankable. I think it came all together, but we're not stopping there um, for sure. And Ashish, in terms of your experience, what, 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 what's the best place to start in terms of using this sort of approach um, and what commodities and what areas? And does it not work anywhere? I want to hear kind of where the challenges are in terms of what you do. What, where's the reality hit the road? And sometimes it's tougher and it, you wouldn't advise uh, applying this sort of thing. So I think, uh, to be honest, yes. I mean, you know, we we have um, had um, a couple of implementations um, that um, basically, I would say, stopped or failed um, because the level of transparency uncovered a level of fraud and child labor that the brand decided not to purchase from the farmers um, or the brand decided not to purchase from the waste pickers, right? And this is just my personal opinion. I think that's the wrong strategy, right? Um, because I think it, the fact that you uncover, which means you have to um, have to solve. I think that's kind of one um, challenge um, that you will run into. Um, and I'll give you a good example, right, um, is, is in the recycling business. In the recycling business, it has multiple tiers, right? So it's a landfill to a buyback center, buyback center to an aggregator, then to a processor, processor to a converter, converter or to a brand, right? So six or seven tiers. And in that example, um, it will not work if you are not willing to hold your downstream suppliers compliant, specifically around the EPR regulations or PRO uh, requirements, right? So I think in our experience, where it doesn't work is that if you have multi-tier supply chains and you're not able to enforce an incentive at the downstream supplier level, they're going to push back because they've been getting away with aggregating data, right? And telling you, yes, we're procuring um, sustainably. Um, so that's kind of just one, one kind of an example. Um, the other piece I would say from a materials perspective, right? Honestly, from any material, right? Like, so, you know, we, we operate, I think 29 different crops and then about uh, eight or nine materials on the packaging side, right? Across 58 countries. So there's not a lot of materials we haven't touched. But there, you know, like cotton is a good example where um, it's extremely complex because it's, you know, from the fiber to the ginning all the way to the finished product, right? And so if you're a, a clothing brand, you're going to say, well, I bought cotton 18 months out, right? What do I do now? And my simple answer to that is, yes, you can. You just have to start thinking about peeling the onion layer and say, tier one, tier two get to your aggregator and your aggregator may end in Shanghai and not give you visibility to Shishang for the current 18 month run, but they will be forced to give you the next 18 month run, right? And that's where you have to challenge your own supply chain um, uh, actors. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's very good. Um, some absolute gold dust coming in the chat, guys. And as I said, 
if anyone's got any insight or other examples or other technologies, please do put them in the chat. I appreciate, we often get a few comments that the chat is madness. It's almost impossible to follow. There's gold dust in there and it's it's very difficult. Night. Don't worry, we digest it all and we'll provide everyone on this call with all the best bits in a very simple document. So, but please do keep adding stuff to it, um, even though it does look a, like a mess of wonderful things, it, it, it will get digested. Um, and a good friend of the SPP, Laurie Helen, um, if you're there, Laurie, um, you ask a good question about about prices along the along the chain. Do you want to just expand on that uh, a little bit more if you're there? Yes, sure. Um, sorry, I can't get my camera on because uh, no, Wi-Fi is lazy today. Um, yes, I was wondering if you or if your suppliers and their own suppliers would also share the price they sell their materials to so that you could theoretically you know, check down to the last year whether the product you purchase is actually paying a fair wage or to be more precise, a living wage, right? Because you may buy to a certain price where your suppliers and your uh, tier two suppliers would say, yes, yes, that was all organic and paid uh, fairly. But, you know, to make sure that this is true, do you have the visibility or the transparency on this kind of information as well? Yes, the, the price uh, per kilo of guar uh, is, is visible. So we know exactly what was the price that the bag of guar was sold uh, oh, through the... Do you hear me? Or Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So so we know exactly what the price, by mm -hmm. the way, in the whole... Somebody muted me or am I okay now? I think that was yes. me. Perhaps. Sorry, Lynn. Okay, that's fine. If you don't want me to stop talking, just mute me. That's fine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, but so starting again, so, the, you know, the price of the guar uh, that, you know, um, was paid to the, in this case, the mama or the, or the father farmer, we know and the volumes that uh, he or, or she sold. And then logically that gives an indication of the price through the value chain. We know how much we paid or are paying to the cooperative and, and, and so on, right? So mm -hmm. yes, there is a price transparency in the same way that, you know, so the customers know what uh, the price is um, that, that, that they pay to us, right? So, and they have, by the way, the customers we work with, um, they have access, we've given access to the platform, right? So we went, it's an ecosystem approach. We are transparent as well, because it's part of the philosophy that we don't do this and then hide it, you know, for a customer to become part of a value proposition in the same way, the price, but also the rebate back, right? So like, like in any procurement world, there is volume thresholds. And when they're reached, there's rebates that, you know, we receive mm -hmm. from our customers and we, you know, uh, push back to the system and we can trace as well. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so again, some great questions coming in there. A lot of the links to the story of Ashish's business and uh, and Lynn's work with Solvay on, on Gua is in the chat. If you can find it, it is in there. Again, it will be um, digested for the audience as well. Um, Halid, you got your your hand up. Do you want to ask a question or, or raise a point? Yep, sure. I was just actually uh, replying to you. Uh, yeah, uh, my question back on, on the challenges uh, I mean, to go from, let's say, a multinational such as Solvay down to the mama farmer, there is a lot of tiers of the supply chain that you need to identify before you can actually implement a solution like this. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more about how you went about identifying those tiers and, and having that, that sort of traceability and any challenges you found there. And my, my, my other thought was on, have you, did you come across any issues with uh, players in the supply chain not willing to disclose information, who they're buying stuff from, how much that they're buying due to uh, privacy concerns. Uh, and if you did, how did you uh, go about that as well? So I will start and then uh, she's jump in. Yeah, I mean, this is not a walk um, in the park, right? So it start with supply chain mapping. So we spend a good deal of really mapping the flows to start with, right? Who are all those players in that supply chain? Uh, because it's not only pure, um, you know, financial players or producers, you know, we, we, we're working with NGOs locally, right? So just there's people, implementation partners that help, you know, train, train the farmers in terms of yields. So there was a whole ecosystem that had to be embarked. We did it during COVID time. I will not deny that that was also, um, you know, complex, right? Because implementing such an initiative, whilst we were not able to go there, my team was not able to go there, as she's 
usually jumps on a flight and is there locally, could not during COVID. Um, so we had to really um, rely and hire strong local project management, right? Fearless project management, driving through those remote areas and really helping us to, you know, from train to getting the partners uh, together. Logically, there was a certain level of, um, you know, suspicion as well, right? So why, you know, why do you want all that transparency? Why don't you trust us? Like I send you Excel files, right? Aggregated data, but right. So there was also a very, you know, profound people um, as topic that that we had to, you know, in partnership to to explain and and to address to get everybody um, on board. Uh, I, I think these are the things that come to mind that um, you, you need you need people that are fearless, but you need people that are have a lot of empathy, a lot of appreciation of the work that has been done and being able to really reach and have boots on the grounds. Ashis? Uh, no, absolutely. I thank you, Lynn. What I would I would add is um, also if you look at the incentive mechanism, right? You can either have the carrot or the stick. What we have found is that if you have a supply chain that's mapped well, like Lynn explained, then you can take an incentive approach at the sub-tier levels, right? So I'll give you two specific concrete examples. At the cooperative level, a lot of the small cooperatives today are hurting because they do not have good access to finance, right? And because the banks are not willing to do supply chain finance at the cooperative level. And this is an important component when you're really looking to peel the onion all the way to the farmer level, all the way to the waste picker level. And what we have found is a best practice is that to really helping the cooperative understand that the value that they own their own data, right? And this is kind of ties into the data privacy element, right? If you did blockchain the right way, then the individual entities, which is the farmer, the co-op, have rights to their own data, right? So this is kind of tied to GDPR compliance and things like that. But the fact that a cooperative now has a book of business where they can prove the harvest that's coming in, but they can also prove that the seed inputs that were given to the farmers or the tools that were given to the waste pickers are basically this entire continuum on the supply chain. What we find that the cooperatives of the mid-tiers that becomes their book of business, which then allows them to get better access to credit and financing. Same thing at the farmer level, right? So the way to break the barriers in those lower level tiers, right, is to really understand that it is an access to credit problem. It's an access to gender equality problem. As you go upstream, yes, you're going to start running into near shore suppliers who are going to push back and say, why would I give you this visibility so think about it this way, right? If I've been buying crop at 14% moisture and I dry it at 12% and sell it to you, why would I actually want to pass the 2% delta to the farmer if the farmer knew he could dry the crop, right? So you're going to run into the challenge, not at the farmer or the co-op level. You're going to run at the bigger aggregator levels who are making a lot of money on the mass balancing, right? In crops like coffee and cacao and things like that. So you just have to look at each tier and figure out if you're going to use a carrot or stick. Thank you. Yeah, that was really insightful. Muted again, muted again. I mute myself, mute everyone else. Uh, I'm not very good at the mute button, am I? Sorry, Lynn. Um, so Eva uh, asked a great question. Eva, do you want to um, uh, yeah, voice your, your thoughts? Hi, yes, uh, Eva here from Earthworm Foundation. I have a question for Lynn, and it's um, we have, we work with uh, FMCGs, and we've we've come across you as well, <laughs> Salve, <laughs> and um, we work with different commodities like palm oil, cocoa, uh, rubber, things like that, and um, I, we've come across where we're when we're asking suppliers and up the tiers for traceability in different areas, different locations around the world, they've come back and said, okay, uh, pay us more and we'll give you that traceability because it's going to take us longer to get the data and get all the, the linkages. And I'm wondering, have you come across that when you're asking, uh, you know, your suppliers and uh, on different commodities or the one that you, you mentioned there? 
are they asking for more money? Well, I hope it was not us uh, telling you that because then I would not be happy. <laughs> no, so frankly, in the use cases we have, we're not charged more for getting traceability, right? So I, I, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, mapping your supply chain, I mean, frankly, also it, it, it's a responsibility. So um, I, I would have a bit of questions then around, you know, the partnership. Uh, right. So, yes, it's complex. Yes, we then as a customer have a responsibility in helping you get there. It's the same with, I would say, with, uh, you know, the carbon neutrality commitments, right? Mapping, you know, the whole chain on emissions. It's extremely complex. And that's indeed why we have, a you know, an industry responsibility to helping, you know, our suppliers to give that visibility. So th that would be my response rather than you know, charge me more, no, uh, you know, how can we help you? And that's the approach, by the way, that we've taken and we continue to take in the other use cases. Does it answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Amazing. Right, um, last couple of minutes before we break and, and finish off uh, with our with our networking. So Lynn and Ashish, I, I'll come to Lynn first, but she's second as well to, to finish off. Um, so for those listening in and those watching the recording, because there's several hundred that are watching, going to re watch the recording very soon, um, uh, what would be your kind of specific pieces of advice for those listening? It's an amazing story of what's possible. And I love the idea of the technology with a soul that really is, you know, not as uh, unfathomable as it, as it could be. That, uh, I think that's wonderful. It helps that mama farmer. But what would be your piece of advice for those listening in that are thinking, how, where do I start? How do I do this? What, what does it mean in reality? How do I convince my boss to want to do this? All those sort of questions that typically I'm just imagining these people's brains. So, Lynn, what would be your kind of two or three pieces of advice for the for those listening in? Yeah, Oliver, it's interesting. So, I, you know, I, I, I came a little bit with that in mind. What are the key three messages I want, I want to give? But based on the questions, I'm going to actually change a little bit, the you know, the approach. First of all, is be bold, right? So I hear there's a little bit of, of hesitance and okay, how do how do I approach this? Well, it, it's going to be a complex journey, right? So you must deeply know your supply chain, and deeply knowing your supply chain is not tracking, you know, the the the, the ton of raw material, you know, through the container and the shipping. It's really that first part, you know, in the more vulnerable supply chains, right, up to the person, right, and 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 being bold about going to that last mile or the first mile, I mean, depend on, you know, what's the look you have on the supply chain. So be bold and expect to find stuff that you're not happy with, right? This is not going to be all rosy. You're going to discover a supply chain that disappoints you in certain measures, right? And then, you know, I think the second piece of advice is you're going to get data and you're going to have to turn it into a strategic business decision. What are you going to do with that, right? So so there is, there is it's not that you make your supply chain transparent is, and then what's next? Map, map your that's next, what's next, right? So I think what is very important. And finally, it's not about a tool. And I had, you know, last week a question, I wanna do blockchain like, like you know, Solvay's doing. I said, well, okay, that's very good, but I don't know what it means to you, right? So don't care about the technology. I let the smart people figure that out, right? <laughs> that's why <laughs> partnerships are so important, right? So, so, I have a use case. We have a use case. This is my problem. Please help me, you know, to reflect on how to solve that problem. And the technology is an enabler. And having the right, you know, innovation and partnership enabled by technology will be key critical. I yeah. think that would be, yeah. Very well put. Ashish? So thank you, Lynn. Um, look, I mean, I would say start really, 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 really small, right? Um, in the sense that pick one line or pick one ingredient um, and say, I want to test this theory out, right? So that would be um, kind of my, my number one um, recommendation. The second recommendation then that ties to it is that it is okay. It is um, very okay not to know past your tier one. Right, and this is anybody out there who thinks, well, I don't really know my farmer because it's so many tiers down, right? It's okay, start small, start with tier one, then get to tier two, and then eventually in six, 12 months, you'll get to tier four, right? I think that's kind of a very critical uh, mistake that I people try to do everything on day one. So pick one line, do that. And then the third one, which is just very dear to me, right? Think profit and purpose, right? If, 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 if you truly want to do this, right? Then you have to have, 
a purpose element to your profitability in your supply chain. Otherwise, you're going to greenwash your way. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, guys, a, a virtual standing ovation, uh, if I may, for both of you. It's a, a story with practical reality in it. Lynn, you're always a star. Thank you. She's always a joy to meet you and, uh, and to talk to you. And uh, you're brilliant with or without the beard. Uh, ignore the fact. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That was not to me, right? Oliver, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, but guys, thank you so much. We, we appreciate so much. And um, uh, again, thanks for all of your support in, in so many ways. Um, and really appreciate your time. Thank you.